A friend of mine was just like, come to Vietnam, we'd be so lucky to have you. And I went there with like, just for a month and I just ended up staying, essentially. Maggie Tra is an Australian-born DJ and producer with Vietnamese and Cambodian heritage. Maggie has lived all around the world, including London, Brussels, Sydney and Hanoi in Vietnam. Driven by a desire to help local Vietnamese artists, Maggie launched Hanoi Community Radio in 2021. She's currently based again in Australia on Eora Land in Sydney. Her music is kinetic, generous and playful. And in both her productions and her DJ sets, she continually embraces not just her own heritage, but also the culture of whatever land she's in. I wanted to talk to her about some of the differences she's noticed between how music works in Vietnam as opposed to Australia, about what she's learned as someone trying to build community in music, and simply, why does she make music in the first place? What does she get out of it? Why make music? My conversation with Maggie Tra was recorded in April 2024. Oh, that's now we're recording. <laughs> this is like our tenth time. What's the knob thing for? <laughs> so the top knob, one knob adjusts the overall volume, uh-huh. and the other knob adjusts what you're hearing from the computer versus what you're hearing directly from your uh, own when microphone. You put the, it's like direct uh, monitoring. Yeah, yeah. Use your profesh skills then. That's that's what we're here for. To use my profesh <laughs> skills. For good and not evil. <laughs> Love a good profesh skill. <laughs> well, we'll 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 talk for a bit, and um, yeah. I, you know, I sort of don't really know what this is yet. Yeah, that's so good. So I just kind of appreciate you being up for it, and I've got I've got a couple more booked in next week, a couple of other chats. Beautiful. Yeah. And this is kind of me just trying to get the ball rolling a bit and kind of figure out what it is while doing it. Yeah, I love that. I what guess. are you calling it? I don't know. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I've got my working title for it is pretty, it feels a bit lame. Okay. It's just, Go. What? <laughs> Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go, Tim. <laughs> the, um, the working title is Why Make Music? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's simple and to the point. Yeah. I don't know if it's yeah. too late. Like, and it's not taken already? Oh, I didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> If anything, it's a, the working title is like just to, it clarifies for me at the most simple level what yeah. conversation I want to have. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, and that, that can, can be like mean anything. It yeah. can be a million things, really. Mm-hmm. But it's just this idea of like one of the reasons why I've never really properly thought about launching a podcast or yeah. tried to make seriously try and do it mm-hmm. is just because there's so much. There's there's already so many like. Oh yeah, There's but that's already... like music as well, though. Exactly, it's not the same thing. It is. It is a similar thing, like. and, and sometimes yeah. I feel like that with music too, where I'm like, mm. "Why should I just add my music to the?" Yeah, mess? Oh, I um, just think mine's the only one, so right. it's coming out. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That must help. <laughs> Maggie Tryer. Margaret. Yeah, is it, my... is it Margaret? It is Margaret. Yeah, parents gave me a white name. <laughs> Why not go with Margaret? Why Maggie? Um, everyone used to think that I was an old lady, like when I was in high school. And I'd call my friends, you know, when you used to call people in their home phones. Yeah. I don't know if you still have one. No. But um <laughs> and they would be like, I would call for, you know, my mate, and the younger sister would be like, Who's calling? I'm like, Margaret, and they'll be like, Ma. I'm like, no, I don't want to talk to your mom. I want to talk to your sister. (laughs) So, yeah, that's why I changed it. I feel like a good place to start is at the very start, which is like baby Margaret, baby Maggie. Oh, God. Yeah. Um, What are your earliest memories of music, whether it's like hearing it in the house or Mm -hmm. family times, childhood times, but like what's when I say that, what do you think of? I think mostly of like temple, so like 
Buddhist prayers type things because uh, obviously my parents would take me there for like Cambodian New Year. It's actually coming up. It's in April. Um, and then also just like Khmer music and mm. Vietnamese music. And that would stem from like bloody neighbours singing karaoke so loud as well, you know. <laughs> yes, and where, where is this specifically in the world? <laughs> so I was born and raised in Bonnery Kites. So apparently a Western Sydney artist, although I do not call myself that. <laughs> but you would go to temple in Western Sydney? Yes, yeah. exactly. There's a Cambodian temple in Bonnery. I was actually talking to my sister about going back because mm. um, I want to learn how to write and read Khmer. And uh, the monks used to teach you that when you were younger. Right. Okay. Mm. And so how is music part of the ceremony? Do you remember? Uh, it's more like the prayers. Right. It's like singing essentially okay. and chanting, Yeah, which kind of gives gives it like a meditative you know, kind of state. Yeah. Yeah. When you were a kid, did you love doing it or did it feel like a kind of a chore? Because I know I went to like one of the schools I went to was an Anglican school and we had, Mm. you know, chapel every Friday morning and had to sing hymns and that was never fun. That was always a a total chore. Yeah. So like our new year is like a water fight. So we would throw water bombs and throw water at each other. Okay. So that was always, so we enjoyed it. We loved going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a water festival basically. And so you, were your parents musical at all? Did they did they play music at home or did they listen no. to a lot of music in the home? They listened to music obviously to like remember their roots, but they were not musical yeah. at all. But I also remember hating like Asian music, Khmer music. I just was just like, there's so many noises all at once. I don't understand what's happening. <laughs> Um, so yeah, they would play it, but they weren't musical right. at all. No. So when you say Khmer music that was maybe mm-hmm. being played in, in the home, like, is that, is that like modern kind of Khmer pop music or is it more traditional or what kind of no. stuff? No, Cambodia is still quite traditional. They yeah. don't really have like a pop scene if I'm being honest, but, um, like growing up, it would just be old school, traditional bands, live bands, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Folk music. Essentially, they did do a little rock for a bit, but it's completely that's why it kind of gives me like temple vibes because mm. it's always quite traditional. Yeah, do you remember any of the names of the bands or the, the songs or anything? No, no, I don't even think my parents knew it. They would have just bought like DVDs or like CDs or whatever they could get from like Cabra Matter, you know? Oh, right, like from the market, yeah, or whatever. like a music store. Yeah, yeah, they still exist now. We go past them, it's so funny, and you're like, oh my god, that's still there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you spend much time now, like, searching around YouTube trying to find some of those songs from your childhood? Uh, not songs from my childhood, but definitely try and find Khmer music that I could probably resonate with a bit more. Yeah. I do try and find, like, more local, newer artists as well. Okay. Um, but hip-hop, hip-hop seems to be a big thing there now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, at what point as a kid do you first have the inkling that you can make music? Like in school, do you remember, I mean, do you remember at school playing the recorder or stuff like that? Like what are your first memories of playing playing music, playing an instrument? Yeah, I do remember it, but I was shit at it. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think, I remember being at music class yeah. and just not being great. So I don't think I ever saw music for me. We used to like make dance moves to the Spice Girls um, and do like Thai karaoke. Don't ask me why we did Thai karaoke because I don't speak Thai, <laughs> but my friend was obsessed with it and so we just used to do that. Okay. Um, but in terms of like music and playing, nah, I didn't. I did not see that in the cards for me. Yeah. I had like immigrant parents, so like music or creatives or whatever, it just, there was no money in that. So there was never like even a thought of that even happening. But it must have come from somewhere though, like because you're, you know, the Maggie Tri that I've gotten to know <laughs> is obsessed with music and loves music and you're an amazing DJ, you have yeah. great taste. So so no. there's a gap here. <laughs> yeah, when, maybe it's like my ancestors or something, yeah. I don't know. So is yeah. it like when in teenage years maybe? Yeah, definitely. I feel like as I got older I just started seeking music and listening to it and like kind of getting into it. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it wasn't until like I was an adult basically that I thought, I'm just going to give this a go. Yeah. But, yeah, when I was younger, I just didn't – 
I guess more I didn't believe that it was possible. That's so interesting. So that's why I never pushed it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At your school, did you have kids that were doing like guitar lessons or doing, you know, other kind of instrumental lessons? You know what? My parents, because they thrift shopped a lot, we didn't grow up with a lot of money. Right. And I remember this really orange keyboard that they bought for us secondhand. And I loved it. I think I learned like, you know, my heart would go on and like twinkle, twinkle, little star. My mom <laughs> loves my heart would go She fucking loves that song. <laughs> Um, Celine Dion, they love. Yeah. Uh, my mom calls uh, Madonna McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, she's like Madonna McDonald's. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> it's pretty funny. So yeah, I remember like playing stuff like that, but then all of a sudden the keyboard disappeared. Oh, I don't know where it went. Okay. So my parents were big on just buying us shit and then giving it away. <laughs> Anyway, 10 years later, I was speaking to a friend of mine who lives across the road. She's Vietnamese. She was my good friend growing up. She's like, yeah, no, your parents gave that to us. I was like, what? Why? I <laughs> loved that. <laughs> so, yeah, there you go. They, my parents are to blame. Just I'm passing say. it around. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then so you're a teenager. You mm-hmm. have had a brief dalliance on a keyboard learning mm-hmm. my heart will go on. Yeah. You've got these memories. You've got this kind of music obviously embedded in your life from mm-hmm. as a child, from going to mm-hmm. temple or from hearing your neighbours singing karaoke. Or, mm-hmm. I mean, we all have music in our lives as kids, but it's that thing at some point it clicks over to being like, oh, like you have a bit more of a, a conscious connection to it. You know, it often yeah. happens when you're a teenager, right, where you're like mm-hmm. you, you become obsessed with it or you have mm-hmm. a deep impact like a particular artist or a particular type of sound. Yeah. Is there anything you remember like that where you're, it just kind of started to hit you in the core in a way that it hadn't before? So this is weird, but I do remember that I used to write songs. I used to write lyrics. Yeah. Just for fun. It was never like anything serious or anything like that. But I do briefly remember that I had that kind of moment. Yes. Yeah. How old? I don't, oh, I can't even tell you. <laughs> Probably like, yeah, it would be like early teens, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. yeah. So you had a notebook mm-hmm. or Obviously something. Obviously, when I knew I writing. could write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't two years old writing lyrics. No. But yeah, definitely. <laughs> A bit later on, yeah. But you had something to say or you just... Oh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I guess like, you know, my parents and family come from a lot of trauma and I think a way to, you know, like most of us to get out of that was to create this own little world and it was just to like write this music, you know. Right. But not not ever seeing myself as an artist or a musician though. Okay. It was just a way to express but nobody look at it. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, like yeah. a diary or something or a journal yeah, entry. Yeah, more or less, yeah. yeah. But they were you were yeah. actually writing lyrics. So you weren't you didn't, weren't necessarily yeah. writing songs. Yeah, I remember but, I remember writing a verse, a chorus, okay. and a verse. Yeah. I don't know if that equates to a song. Yeah. I mean, my daughters write songs <laughs> like that just, uh, even cute. now. You know, my, like my yeah. eight-year-old has currently like she's posted up Posted it up on the wall next to her bunk bed. She's on the bottom oh, bunk cute. with her older sister. Or, no, she's on the top bunk with her younger sister mm. underneath. Mm. And she has posted up on the wall next to her top bunk like uh, a piece of paper from like last year where she'd written, she decided to write a song and it didn't have a melody or anything. She just wrote the words first. And I can't, it's something along the lines oh, of like, nice. I love you, I want to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> But she, but she repeats but, the same phrases and there's bits yeah. that are obviously the chorus. And, yeah, at one point That's I got her to it. sing it and she kind of – I could tell that she was making the melody up as she was going. Oh, like the lyrics she had, but the melody she was just sort of – that seemed less relevant. It was That's just probably what I was down. doing, yeah, yeah. I kind of feel like it was more words than it was melody. Yeah. For sure. Do you have any of them still, like if you got those old notebooks? No way. I don't have anything from my childhood. It was a bit of a mess. So, yeah. like, yeah, nah. I don't have anything. Yeah. Just my brain okay. that doesn't remember. <laughs> that developed over time. But I've never tried to write. I thought about it, but I've actually never tried to write music. Yeah. Yeah, since then. Well, we'll get back to that because you, you are making music and releasing yeah. it. Um, <laughs> so you are writing music. And but... then I never became a musician. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, okay. So that's interesting. So you're obviously, you're starting to feel like you're getting something from the process. You're having some really early version of creating, you know, and Ooh. understanding, getting a good feeling from it or processing something through writing those words down. Mm-hmm. What, what kind of music were, were you into when you were a teenager? Oh, uh, back then I loved R&B. Like yeah. loved, loved R&B. I guess a lot of influences would come because I had older siblings and there's quite a huge, I think it's quite a big age gap. It's like five years. Right. So I was kind of just like the young one that was like, oh, what they're listening to and I'm going to listen to that. So, yeah, it was very a lot of R&B, which I loved, yeah. hip-hop. Mm-hmm. Like what songs? Get specific. Oh, uh, gosh. Trying to remember back in that era. I mean, I remember like Aaliyah and things like that, yes. that kind of way. Brandy and Monica loved mm-hmm. her. That boy is mine. Hilarity because what, bo- what boy do we want these days? None. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but I did love the Spice Girls. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm getting a pretty clear picture. That's that's definitely a time and a place. Spice Girls, <laughs> yeah, Brandy, Monica. exactly. Aaliyah. <laughs> exactly. And so when do you start DJing? You know, when, does that happen when you're a teenager or does that come a bit later? No, that comes a bit later. But the funny thing is I remember buying a controller probably when I was like 20 yep. and being like, I want to try this and going on Gumtree, buying it, going to this dude's house with my sister, he was like, I can give you music, blah, 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 if this is something you want to do. And like this dude was like, I mean, maybe he wasn't 40, but he looked like he was and I was like super young being like, oh, man, this guy's still going. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but ouch. I never t- <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was so far. You know, when you're young, you're like, yeah. man. There's yeah. nothing wrong with being 40. I know. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm not young either, right? Yeah, but no, I totally um, get it. But you know, you're when like, you're wow, young, you're old just man. like, wow. But also yeah. cool, still making it happen, <laughs> sick, giving me life advice. Yeah. Um, and then I never used it. Right, okay. Never touched it, stayed. It literally is still at my mum's house now. It's super old. Um, I just didn't have anyone to teach me. I just, I just wasn't motivated. That's interesting. So it was something that I wanted to do but just never did it. Do you think it was that you weren't motivated or just that you you didn't know what the next step was? Cuz like yeah. even at that time cuz that's a that's a handful of years ago. Yeah, like these days you was... might have got a controller, you know, you order it from Amazon and then you're on YouTube and you yep. just that you, off you go. Whereas yeah, I'm, that's I'm, true. with this this would have been a little bit too early maybe for yeah. like I'll just figure it out myself by watching YouTube exactly. clips. Like you do need you need like cuz I think about how I got into creating music, which is mm-hmm. learning guitar. And, oh, nice, and, yeah. And I, but not learning guitar in a traditional sense, just a mate mm-hmm. in high school mm-hmm. who knew mm-hmm. how to play guitar because he was already playing other instruments and he just sort of picked the guitar up and figured it out. Oh, and we we're nice. all just like, my God, he's the genius. He's, yeah, he's this amazing. musical genius. Mm-hmm. And he just taught the rest of us how to play power chords. And if, but if he oh, hadn't been there to do that, I'm not sure yeah. who would have done it for me because again, That's true. pre YouTube. So, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't think like I knew anyone creative. I mean, all my friends were Asian in Sydney, you know, like me, basically. But um, yeah, so they all went the traditional kind of route and all just like got to get a job, got to buy a house, blah, blah, blah. So. Nobody I knew was in it. Right. And I think I also thought, like, what, what what's going to happen afterwards? Like, I don't know how to get booked and I don't know how to, you know, yeah. get gigs. So I was, like, thinking about that as well. Yeah. Um, but even that's weird yeah. now if you think about it. Like, you know, I think it's something that – this is something I'm really interested in is this idea of, like, we get – at some point we get told that music's a thing that if you can't do it as your job, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah, that's you know it. I, mean? I suffered a lot with that. You were actually. like, well, I shouldn't even yeah. bother just doing it, f- even though it's really fun and mm-hmm. there's lots of good reasons for me just to do it for myself. Yeah. I, I better not mm-hmm. do it because it's not serious. But people are so judgy, <laughs> like people yeah. who have real jobs. Yeah, do they're so that? judgy. Really? Well, when I was younger, you especially like Asian like friends, 100%, right. because it's like I remember going in a holiday home and I think I was like, I can't remember what I was doing. I must have been doing like editorial assistant or something. And they were all teachers. And like 
they were just like, oh, so like, is that your hobby kind of thing? I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> it's just like <laughs> an editorial assistant's not a job, but I understand. So I think they always looked at me like I wasn't getting my life together. You know what I mean? Like I was falling behind. So I think that was also, I think that kind of made me start a bit later. Yeah, right. Yeah, so we've skipped into your 20s and so, so you, and you, you're you doing various jobs through your 20s, yeah? When you say editorial assistant, like what 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 is that? Uh, so I used to work for a publishing company here in Sydney yeah. actually and just the editorial assistant for the magazines. So it was like three or four or something. Yeah, okay. It was B2B. Yeah. It was mean. It was a, a mean corporate environment unfortunately. Right. Did you Did you ever feel comfortable doing that? Um, I mean, I was great. Elves. It was just everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I got along. I got along with the graphic designers. You know what I mean? Like I would go downstairs and hang out with them a lot, yeah. as opposed to the like the journalists and the editorial people. I found them very boring. Um. So yeah. Yes and no. It taught me a lot. I work on Mondays because of this job. Yeah. Right. Oh, you still have like. <laughs> A Monday, a Monday job? Is that what you mean? No, as in like I have that Monday mentality. Even oh, though I right. don't, even though I don't have to work on a Monday, on Monday. Yeah. I still like Monday's the day where I get things done. That's an interesting idea. Like there are some things, some valuable things to be learned from working in a in a quote unquote professional work environment. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if mm-hmm. you if if you are the rare creative person who sort of sidesteps quote unquote real life entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, because of some fortune early in your career, that mm-hmm. can kind of set you up for a pretty unrealistic version of what life is, particularly if you maybe you have a few years, you're 18, 19, 20, you're doing great in music, it's kind of come at you from the side and you yeah. just skip a bunch of growing up, you skip a whole bunch of adulting and then you kind of might get spat out in your mid-20s and then True. you're kind of a little bit, then you really are a bit behind, you know. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it could go either way, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, either way, I'd crush it, I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> After my 20s, I'd be like, sick, did that. What can I do now? <laughs> I'm I, over it. <laughs> I, gotta, I, I have to ask you, Maggie, like this is one of like, you know, I'm, I, I like the idea of like I'm trying to do this really unstructured and not think too much about it. But yeah. one of the few questions I did have for you, very mm. specific question, was this this energy of yours, which is just addictive, irrepressible, mm giggly cheeky <laughs> where, where does that come from is that from have you inherited that from your parents or is it your fa- a family thing or friends or you've got such uh, a yeah. you've got such a uniquely positive quality where does that come yeah. from yeah oh that's so sweet thank you I mean I'll say obviously trauma but it's very much just like I had a bad upbringing right but I don't want that to be a reflection of who I am And I always want better for myself. Mm. You know what I mean? So like watching my parents and like having to see what they had gone through, particularly my mom, it was very much just like she would always say, I don't ever want you to be like me kind of thing. Really? And yeah, because she suffered so much, you know. And so I just went the opposite and was just like, fuck it, you know. We've only got this one life and... The other day, there was a friend of mine was talking about like being on a diet and stuff. I'm like, dude, eat what you want. What if you died later on and the last meal you had was sweet potato with a fish? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know what I had? They're like, what? I'm like, I had a meat pie and chicken nuggets for breakfast. <laughs> you know, fish with sweet potato actually sounds not too bad. She was so sad eating it. Her expression <laughs> on her face because she brought her own meal. That was the thing. Right. You know, when you bring your own lunch and you're like, oh, I want something better. Okay. And I'm always just like, go for the better thing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, obviously, it comes a lot from, like, not having a lot. Yeah. And knowing that everything I get is, like, a bonus in life. Like, mm. nothing's ever given to me you know what I mean and I've had to work for it um and yeah 
I don't know where it comes from, really. It definitely doesn't come from my parents. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say, like, because I imagine there, there's a version of it where you're like, well, I had, I had a rough upbringing or I saw rough things when yeah. I was younger and yeah. now I kind of perform a version of everything's great, everything's going to be great as mm. a kind of coping mechanism whereas getting to know you, that's not what's happening with you. It's very no. genuine. It's not a performance. Yeah. It's not no. a you're not like gritting your teeth and going, Yay, and smiling. <laughs> like you know, no. so it's what it's such a great kind of freedom that you have. So here's a maybe trickier question. Okay. D- does music or your relationship with music fit in to that puzzle somehow? Is there a part where music mm. or the creative process has helped you find this version of yourself or bring it to the fore? I think if I'm being honest, it all stems down to like not caring right. as much anymore. Yeah. Deep down, whether it's like music or about like what other people think about me and what I'm doing. I think when I was quite younger, I'd realized that I wasn't ever going to do what my parents wanted me to do. But even if I did everything that they wanted me to do, it wasn't going to make them happy. Um, so once I learned that I needed to do things to make myself happy, that's kind of when things shifted and changed. Mm. And I do think it's obviously the people that surrounds me as well. Like my sister's super amazing and she supports my everything, you mm. know. I would just be like, I'm going to stop working and do PR or I'm going to just go DJ and all this kind of stuff. And it's like having people around me be like, yeah, you can do this or I went up recently to Brisbane and my high school friend was like, I always told you, don't you remember when we were young that you were going to be something? And I remember laughing at her being like, what are you talking about? And, um, yeah, she wasn't wrong. I think my personality kind of brings things out of people and that brings me joy, Mm. you know, seeing other people happy, um, seeing other people laugh and stuff, like that makes me happy. And people allowing me to be myself is probably the reason I am the way that I am, mm. potentially. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, music as well, for sure. But never never thought that music making it right. would bring me joy. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk about then some of the community groups and the, and the organising you've done because it seems like mm-hmm. such a natural thing. I mean, you say just there like – that it brings you great joy to s- when other people are happy or to see other people achieve. So mm-hmm. it makes a lot of sense that you've done these different projects where you bring people together. So mm-hmm. let's talk about Hanoi Community Radio mm-hmm. and how that started and when it started and, and yeah. what it is even, you know, because you've talked a bit to me a little bit mm-hmm. about that, but I'm still kind of, I mean, you, you need to take me there. Like I, I want to see yeah. it to really understand it. Can, can you... <laughs> Take us back to where that idea came from. and So so you were living in – because I know you've lived in Europe yes. for a bit and you've lived mm-hmm. in Vietnam a little bit, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. So when, when was this started? Uh, so the radio started about four years ago, but I was living in Vietnam for like two years, I think, before I started it. A friend of mine was just like, come to Vietnam, we'd be so lucky to have you. Yeah. And I went there with like – just for a month and I just end up staying essentially. Um, I just felt like the music scene even in Asia is kind of the same in the rest of the world but worse. (laughs) (laughs) I think here when you see, you know, white people in music, it's normal. It's like a normal thing to see. But when you see white people taking and owning venues in music, in Asia, it's such a weird thing to see as a Westerner because you go to Asia thinking everyone's going to be Vietnamese that's going to be owning clubs and, you know, there's going to be Vietnamese DJs everywhere. Um, but it was the opposite. I felt like the foreigners were taking all the space, unfortunately. Right. So this is in Hanoi? Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. And it's a very boys club there as well. Right. So I'd already started for the girls and that was doing great, you know. But even within that, 
are we still part of the cool kids? Which annoys me because I feel like I'm not a cool kid and I never try to be a cool kid. So hang on. So what's for the girls? Was that for the girls? Is my DJ workshops yeah. and the female non-binary collective that I have? Yeah, and is that in that Sydney? started in that started in Vietnam oh, actually? Right. Okay. So I did that before Hanoi Community Radio, yeah. and then I was just like, okay, but it was the cool kids. Well, the club scene, me getting booked and everything, I was still part of. I was part of this cool kids thing, right? And sometimes you can kind of get caught up in it. You know, when you're in the music industry, you're like, oh, this is great. I'm getting gigs, blah, blah, blah. And then I just kind of looked around. I'm just like, these are all friggin' expats around me. Like, I think I'm the Asian one and there wasn't that many Vietnamese people. I'm like, this is so weird. Like, I'm part of the problem. Right. <laughs> yeah. So... I remember just trying my best to build a spreadsheet for clubs and um, putting a list of local Vietnamese people. Instead of, like, telling them do better, I was just like, look, here's a list of creatives that you can potentially book and use for your gigs, mm. you know, do what, do what you want with that. And how did you find them in Hanoi? Um, so I think the beauty of Vietnam and living there was they were like drawn to me as well, right. which is something I didn't expect, um, because I feel like I look more Cambodian than I do Vietnamese. So I've never felt, um, that attached to it, right. but I think they just saw what I was doing. They would literally just come up to you and just be like, Hey, are you Maggie Tra? Um, and it would make me laugh because it's like, you know, you can just call me Maggie because I'm pretty sure there's no one else here that is called Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always like, are you Maggie Tra? So it's such a small space where everyone knows everyone mm -hmm. or if they're seeking it, they will, they will know what I'm doing. And that kind of brings in all the creatives and the beautiful thing that I was able to achieve is sometimes there's a separation between arts you know, and music. Right. Whereas I was able to kind of exist in both worlds. So through that, I connected with a bunch of different creatives. Yeah. So hang on, what do you mean by that? So in Hanoi, you're talking about like arts in terms of like institutions, like museums and galleries and things like that versus Yeah, music like just venues? art. Oh, well, just art artists, like people. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's very separated right. in Hanoi, because I think arts is would be classed as more of a real job okay. in Vietnam, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. because yeah, in what way? What do you It's mean? more value. Right, it right. has more value. Okay. Yeah, it has more value. There's a lot of art galleries. It's like a prestige thing. I feel like mm -hmm. um, obviously a luxury for Vietnamese people who are come from wealth, or you know, if their kids are allowed to study it as well. Mm. But yeah, it's seen like above. I feel like music. Right. Interesting. And you, how's your Vietnamese, like language barrier wise? Like, yeah, so that was another thing of why I didn't think anyone would like me because my Vietnamese sucks. <laughs> but <laughs> I still took lessons like every week. I had a tutor come through and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I can understand a lot more than I can speak. Um, but I grew up with my mum mostly. And so she spoke Khmer, which is why I'm more fluent in Cambodian. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you're in Hanoi. You've, mm -hmm. you, you're one of the cool kids. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> you've got the For the Girls workshops where you're teaching, mm -hmm. um, DJing to, to female and non-binary mm -hmm. people, but you've, you, mm -hmm. you want to be a bit more connected to local Vietnamese people who mm -hmm. love music. So, so mm -hmm. how does Hanoi Community Radio come up as a concept? Like were, were you already in Sydney or in other cities involved with community radio stations? Like had you, had you seen how they'd worked before? Well, so I grew up with community radio, to be honest. So in university, I was at 4 Triple Z for like a year or two. Yeah. When I was living in Brussels, Kiosk Radio started. And that was very new, the whole online radio station kind of concept. Right. And I think another club was actually going to do it in Hanoi. So I just never did it. Um. And then I was just like, I'm not going to wait for someone else to say that they're going to do it and not do it. So I was just like, why don't I just do it, you know? There was a lot of anxiety with launching it as well because I'm also like, like 
fully Vietnamese. There's this weird thing of like you're not 100% or whatever. Um, but I kind of felt like I knew the right people and I knew a lot of people who would be interested in Keen. They just didn't know how to do it because I was running like podcast workshops as well for women and non-binary people. Basically any skill that I'd learned in the West, you know, I was then teaching and just running workshops there. Mm. So I knew that people were keen to do that. I also know that like in Asia, we're not really brought up to like talk about our feelings and we suppress a lot of our things. So I wanted like an outlet for the younger Vietnamese to like be heard or be seen. It was always my intention to create it and they just have it. Like I didn't really want anyone to know that I was doing it either. So for a long time, I wasn't like the face of it. I didn't really do PR for it. I remember Mixmag got in touch wanting to do something, but I just was just like, it wasn't something that I wanted to turn into like a music thing. I didn't want it to be like a DJ music thing. Right. I you weren't really trying to do, be it... like NTS Vietnam or no, anything like that. No, yeah. I really wanted it to be like anything, like yeah. they could talk about anything, do anything. It would be, it could be in English, could be in Vietnamese, could be in like whatever they wanted it to be. Yeah. Truly community, local level you know. Yeah, like just they take it yeah. kind of thing and I'm just someone who is able to assist them in that. Okay. Yeah. So when it launched, like what kind of, what is what are some of the shows that were on and some of the, the volunteers who oh, were yeah. presenting? Like what, what did it sound like? It was kind of cute. We had like philosophy kind of talks and then we had um, dating, like a dating show. Lots of music as well, <laughs> Vietnamese music, things like that. Yeah, it was like a mix, mix bag. And how did you fund it? Like, because you, how did you get the resourcing for it to run it? Because this is, it was like, a, it's a web station, right? Like, were you, yeah, was it exactly. FM transmitted or anything, or it was just a stream basically online? Just streaming online, but even yeah. then, like, programs and stuff were quite costly. I have mm. DJ equipment already, fortunately, but the original idea was for me to just fund it myself. Not that I was rich, but like <laughs> I was like doing music PR and like getting clients from around the world and living in Vietnam. So I was just like, maybe this is my thing that I can use my money to kind of give back to Vietnam. Mm. Um, but then one of my girls actually, for the girls, one of the DJs in Hanoi was like, why don't you try and get funding? And she knew a few NGOs around Asia because she had worked for them. And I was like, oh, yeah, if you can help me write a proposal, you know, and a budget and stuff. She's like, yeah, I'll help you do that. So we did that. She sent it. It was literally just a one sheet thing. It was nothing crazy. Um, and then, yeah, we ended up getting a grant, um, some funds from Bangkok, which was amazing. Mm. Um, but I feel like a lot of that has to do with, like, my work with Further Girls and pushing women and non-binary people and that kind of stuff that really like put me at the forefront for these kind of things. So you you might not even think too consciously about this, but I'm trying to figure out why 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 do it at all? Like what what what's motivating you to do this? I mean is it is it just purely that feeling of you know that it brings you joy when you see other people grow and other people succeed? And I guess the other part of the question is did you see people grow through doing this? Like mm -hmm. were you able to see in a concrete way that people were coming into contact with you and, and learning new skills, coming into contact with music or other people and then kind of coming out the end of the process having grown or having changed in positive ways? Yeah, definitely. I feel like it's like a, a combination of both. But my main reason was just to give something back because I honestly moved there. I'm not going to say that Vietnam was obsessed with me, but they were like obsessed with me <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and supported my everything. One day, you're going to you know take me I to mean? Hanoi one day and there's going to be a statue of you in the middle and there's going to be these big billboards. This is oh, the uh, I took my Maggie friend Tra and... Secondary School. <laughs> this, is, this is the I Margaret know, Tra I'm Honorary sorry. Wing of the Children's Hospital. <laughs> took my friend last year and he was just like I didn't realize you were so famous no I'm kidding <laughs> I just meant that they were just like so supportive like yeah. they didn't have to welcome me you know what I mean I feel like they didn't have to support me I would run workshops and they would just be like why are you doing this and my whole thing was like why not like why wouldn't I do this you know mm. 
I come up from like a pretty good educational background. I feel like it's easier for us to learn things in the West. And if Mm. we want something, we'd go for it. I noticed that in Asia, a lot of, I guess the upbringing is more being humble and not having that overconfidence to do things. And I had that. I had that confidence to do things. So I think that was like a big thing for me of like, why wouldn't I do something? And I think I think that all the time anyway, when someone asks me things, it's just mm. like, why are you doing that? I'm like, why not? <laughs> uh, but yeah, mostly to give back, you know, I just felt like they were so kind and generous to me. And then, yeah, 100%, I've seen a lot of my presenters grow. One of them just started with us and now they DJ everywhere, which is, like, so amazing and so great to see, you know. Um, And then some of them are just, like, had no idea how to work in the music industry, like how to book people, how to organise tours, how to just even communicate, (laughs) you know what I mean, and, like, I don't think I talk like music talk or anything, but like building relationships with people. um, And yeah, even just recognizing that they needed a community Mm. or that they needed a space. I don't think they realized that that's something that they needed to feel like they belonged somewhere. You mentioned there was one presenter that's gone on to DJ a lot around the place and stuff. Like, is there there any specific examples of people who you notice like not not even necessarily in terms of like professional outcomes for them but just that you know that you saw the the value in it for them as people you know like yeah definitely I think like just giving them the confidence like I can see that their confidence has grown Mm. a lot more and then also them wanting to help other people out as well which is such a, a big thing for me you know um seeing their journeys and then also like wanting to bring other people to is like the best thing I feel like. Yeah. I mean, you're leading by example, like your, your desire to give back your generosity, your positivity. Mm -hmm. I imagine the people you've worked with in these projects, they take that on board. They, they take part of that with them. Um, you know, when they, when they maybe leave to go on and do something else, they, they do, they leave music or go and find some other job or they go, they, they go to the next part of their lives, but they've taken that with them. Even if, you know, they maybe don't DJ as much in the future or they kind of, you know, it moves to the, more to the background of their lives. They've taken something else from the experience, not just the, the DJ skills or the, the fun hang on the radio, you know? Yeah. My friend reckons that I could tell anyone what to do if I just laugh afterwards. (laughs) (laughs) Which is so true. The other day I noticed his shows are always late. And I'm like, bro, your shows are always late. I'm going to yell at you. <laughs> and then giggle. <laughs> Basically. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, here's, so, yeah. oh, here's a tougher question maybe or just like a, I want to open a space Go. for you to talk about this. Like, so because it just sounds such like such a positive experience. And maybe, you know, you're, you're in you're in Hanoi with an understanding of the local scene and the culture, but also with this Western perspective, having grown up in Australia. And so you're in this unique spot to, you know, provide people with some skills that maybe you feel like you've gotten the benefit of from, from having a different upbringing. And I imagine that would, that would just, and also you've become like weirdly semi-famous and people are coming up to you and going, <laughs> are you Maggie Tra? And then you find yourself back in Australia. And and by the time you move back to Sydney, you, you have started um, DJing and releasing some music under your own name. You're getting write-ups here and there, different articles from websites. And, you know, there's just a little bit of a sniff of like, who is this Maggie Tra? Mm. What was it like coming back to Australia and like reconnecting in some way to how music mm. functions here? Um, mm-hmm. How did that work? How did it feel after mm-hmm. having been in Vietnam for a few years? Yeah. I mean, I have to say my experiences are somewhat a little bit different because you also supported me when I was abroad as well. So I did have a few people who supported me when I was overseas. So coming back, it was nice to like meet them in real life. You know what I mean? And that kind of made things a little bit better for me. But in terms of like community and feeling like you're part of something, that doesn't exist here, I feel like. I don't feel like I'm part of anything really. Um, And that's kind of like the sad reality of the music industry here in Sydney. 
It's like you always have to prove that you're worth it or that, you know, you deserve this gig or, yeah, this is like you have to be a cool kid times a thousand, but you have to be a cool kid that never left the country. (laughs) Really? (laughs) Yeah, like for DJs anyway, the ones who get the most gigs are the ones who stayed here like forever. Um, and because Sydney is just like a bit lazy and doesn't like doing any research, they use the same people all the time and then get those people to then book their own people Mm. and it just becomes a vicious cycle like that. And I think for people who are starting out, that's a hard space to get into. So for me, I was fortunate that I had a lot of Asian diaspora people that supported me and when I came to Sydney booked me for gigs And then that kind of like for me wasn't really enough because I'd gotten so much overseas, like even in London and Europe, and I was just like, why is Australia so slow? You know what I mean? So the next year I was just like, everyone's going to know who I am and this is it basically. So I ended up contacting venues and letting them know what I was doing, who I was. Then I started playing more, getting more gigs, doing all this kind of stuff. And it was just super funny because, like, after they booked me, they would just be like, we looked on you online and we were just like, how the hell did we not know who you were? And I was just like, that's just Sydney in a nutshell. Like, people in Melbourne are telling Sydney people who I am, (laughs) which to me is wild. And it happens so often, you know. I had a friend who... um, who's in, from Melbourne, came up here, played at a club. And I'm like, yeah, I've been, like, getting these things, blah, 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 blah. And he's like, yeah, you know why, Mags? I'm like, why? Because he actually works for Ableton. And he was just like, yeah, I told them about you. And I'm just like, why is a Melbourne person telling, like, Sydney people about me? Bloody hell. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just such a hard space of, like, also I don't think people even want to help you here. I know that sounds really mean, but it's like, the harsh reality, you know. Again, I'm kind of like a cool kid. I have no idea why. So I do get opportunities. But I do know that other people don't and it's difficult for them and it's hard and it's unnecessary. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, it's hard to know. I mean, you you could answer this much better than me because you've spent time in um, Hanoi, obviously, but... You know, I just ima- I just wonder whether in Melbourne and Sydney, in particular, our music scenes are are kind of they've existed for a while, so the the structures are fairly solidly built, even though they are really quite flimsy. There's no safety net, and you know, it's you often from the outside think it's much bigger than it actually is once you get in the mm-hmm. inside of it, but mm-hmm. but still there is this kind of sense of. It, it, there is a nugget at the middle of the music ecosystem that is the quote unquote industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wonder whether living in Hanoi like that, I, I am, I imagine as an outsider that probably there isn't, there isn't that sense that that is even there. And so feeling like, well, that's, that's not even a thing I can access. I am, I have to make my own thing from scratch. Like I have to build my own community. I have to start Mm -hmm. my own radio station. And actually that's the joy in it. And possibly there's Mm -hmm. space and there's room, even room like in the imagination of the city for something like that Mm -hmm. to exist. Whereas I feel Mm -hmm. like in Melbourne and Sydney and maybe it would be the same in those big like music cities like London and New York and Berlin, I'm not sure, Mm -hmm. where there isn't the space to imagine something new because mm. there's there is already stuff around there's already radio stations there's already record labels there's already different scenes and little cliques of people that have rusted together and give each other the same opportunities like that it's harder to imagine and maybe also just mm. like what about like just the general cost of living like in in yeah. living in australia is it kind of doesn't matter where you are economically it's mm. a grind like mm-hmm. you have to be pretty financially set up for life to not be a grind in Australia in terms of work-life balance. Whereas mm-hmm. is it is that different in, in Hanoi as well? Like from your experience, was it just easier to to cook up these ideas and build these communities because you were just a you had a bit more time and a bit more flexibility? Um I would say not really. I yeah. think it's more of like a mentality, yeah, yeah. to be honest, and just like way of living and how we care about 
people yeah. and how we care about others okay. genuinely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think London's also, like, in terms of, like, me living there, I thought it was there was still always space. But they have more people. Yeah. And they have so many things going on that so many people can just go to all these different things. So it, I think it's so different. I think for them they welcome new things, which is pretty awesome to still see. Mm. In a place where, like, music is everywhere. I just remember being part of, like, different, you know, friends in different music things and bands and, like, whatever. For Asia in particular, I do think it's more of just, like, a genuine feeling of caring, you know, even if it's just, like, a complete stranger crossing the road or, like, you know, self-awareness of other people as well Um, and that feeling, you know. I definitely felt it during covid where the government was just like leaving fruit and vegetables on the side of the road for local people. Mm. They're just like things like that where it's you do care about others. And I don't see that in the West. I see people caring but because they want something. And I'm very like I can notice it a lot, you know, when Westerners ask to play at my radio station. It just comes from so much privilege, you know. It's so different of how a Vietnamese person or an Asian person would ask to play at someone else's country's station. Right. Here I just feel like everyone's just so involved within themselves that it's hard to even form a community. I even struggle with it with further girls, if I'm being honest. You know, I almost gave up. Bloody ball ache. (laughs) I think you know what it's like as well, trying to run a community and trying to get people to just be self-sufficient and want things to grow together and not grow just for themselves, you know. There's a point where, like, because I can get my girls and non-binary people gigs and it would just be like they wouldn't even go to other people's gigs but want to be part of Further Girls and it's just like, I never had to explain these things to people in Vietnam. They went to each other's gigs. They went to each other's houses. They cooked food for each other. We did things together and supported each other. Whenever they had their first DJ sets, we would go there. Here it's like I have to tell them, like, if you want to be part of this collective, you have to show up. You have to, like, let people know that you support them. Otherwise, this whole thing doesn't work. And also, why are you part of it if you don't even believe in these, like, core values? I think that's it. Like, it's that idea of, you know, are you you in the community because you think that at some point in the future it's going to be of benefit to you that you are in it, Mm -hmm. right? Which may be true, but is that your primary reason for being in it? Or are you in it because you just genuinely enjoy being in it? You know, like this. Yeah, I I think there's. I think community, like, is just is its own reward, mm-hmm. um, being part of a group of people, that feeling of being kind of mutually supported and the feeling of being nurtured and, like, just the experience of being in a room or being in a conversation or being in a in a chat room or whatever it is with mm-hmm. a bunch of people that you feel seen by, mm-hmm. that just on its own is its own reward. Mm-hmm. So I think, yeah, I've, I've seen... <clears throat> I've seen a bit of that too with some of the community spaces that I've flirted with trying to create sure. where you're just mm-hmm. like there is often – it's never this simple but it does sometimes feel like there's two kinds of people. There's the person that's kind of dipping their mm-hmm. toe in to see if they can get something out of it, yeah. which is not invalid but if those are the only people you have in your community then it's not really a community. It's just a bunch of no. people looking mm-hmm. for something that's going to help them. Exactly, as opposed yeah. to realizing, as opposed to just realizing that just being in the community is what can help you, like just, mm-hmm. just interacting and – being open with people and being vulnerable with people. But, you know, I I can't speak to the difference because I've obviously only ever lived in Western cities. Like I've lived in Mm -hmm. Melbourne pretty much my whole life Mm -hmm. despite travelling a bit. And, yeah, um, yeah, it's probably only in in recent like the last five to ten years, mainly just through doing a lot of reading that I've Mm -hmm. come to really understand how individualistic Western culture is and how kind of atomised we all are. We're all very much set on these kind of um, individual paths Mm-hmm. where we, we seek out great things for ourselves as if yeah. that's what's going to make us happy and and make us Definitely. feel good when it's really know, not. it's like, aren't you <laughs> bored of yourself yeah. also? Bloody hell. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, no, like seriously, it's one of those things. So it's like, I know mental health is a big thing for sure, but a lot of communities help you with mental health. You know what I mean? Like being part of something is something that helps you to get better. And having my collective and for them to still retreat and to be on their own, it's just like, but you you have something here, like a tool that could help you engage and help you mentally feel better, but you're not utilising that, you know? That to me is such a bizarre thing. Mm. And it took me a while to like get used to that. And then also like, because I'm so nice that I don't know if people are, you know, and then I like make excuses for them and like all this stuff. And to a certain point, you know, when is it enough? And then you kind of get taken advantage of. It's difficult. It's definitely like not an easy thing. I think I make things look very easy. (laughs) And loads of people are just like, yeah, so then can you do this? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, do you, uh, am I not doing enough right now? I have a radio station and I run a female collective and I DJ and run workshops. Like, seriously, is there not someone else that you could be bothering? <laughs> um, once you give, there are always people who are going to want you co- to continue to give more. And that was like a big lesson that I had to learn, mm. um, even in the name of community, you know, even in the name of something, someone can still put a negative spin on that, which is super sad. I want to ask you like what your day-to-day relationship with music is. Like <laughs> what if, why are you giggling? Why is that funny? <laughs> <laughs> because my day-to-day is hilarious, <laughs> but yeah, go. <laughs> well, just in terms of like, you know, do you, are you practice like you DJing every day or are you making music oh, every day? No way. How often do you no reckon you get way. to do it? Um, so I'm very project based when I make music. Um, I don't just like go and play around, for example, I'm trying to get better at it, but I'm not really like that. So now I'm working on a new album. So I know that I have to make music (laughs) So for this period, I guess I would try and make a song maybe like two a week or something like that. Obviously I don't put like limits on like what I'm supposed to make and what I'm not supposed to make, but I do my best to kind of curate that or at least think about it, make it, track names, whatever, and put some effort into that, inspiration, um, what I want to put into them, kind of thoughts and feelings and whatnot. I only DJ on the weekends, um, whether it be like a Friday or a Saturday. But, yeah, it's one of those things where it's like sometimes it's like once a week and then every now and then it's like, three in one day, one night and you're like oh bloody hell you know but then the rest of the day I'm like doing nothing mm. so <laughs> it's just like yeah it kind of gets like that I always balance my life you know when you like hang out with music people and all they do is talk about music and you're like oh I'm bored let's like talk about something else <laughs> I mean this is obviously different we're in a podcast <laughs> but like <laughs> But, yeah, I don't think my life revolves around music. I don't listen to music in my spare time. Right. Actually. Okay. I listen to podcasts. Mm. So you're heading back to Vietnam next week just for a chill for a couple of weeks, yeah? What are you looking forward to Yeah, about that? Food, definitely food. Um, and then, yeah, celebrating the radio's fourth year. Wow. So we're going to throw a party at a club in Hanoi at Unmute, which is going to be super cute. But, yeah, just catching up with everyone, seeing how the scene is. You know, I'm so grateful to be part of that scene because it is so supportive. Like I go back to Vietnam and that music scene, it's just flourishing and they all support each other and they all go to each other's gigs. It feels very wholesome. And it just gives me like a little like energy boost to like come back and be like, this is what people are bloody doing. (laughs) And do you think it is like slowly changing? You mentioned before that when you first arrived, it just felt like Mm -hmm. it was all the foreigners and the expats that Mm -hmm. were running the show and owning the venues and booking the venues. Like, do you think that's slowly changing? Yeah. Yeah. There's been a shift. I think COVID kind of forced everyone to like having to book local people and looking internally Um, but yeah it's 100% changed. Southeast Asia has also been on the rise. I think nobody used to really talk about 
um, those kind of countries and music are associated at all. But it's finally getting there. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, Maggie Tra, Margaret, mm-hmm. <laughs> what a joy. Timothy. Are you Timothy? Yeah, I am actually. Oh, there you go. Look at us. Look at us go. Abbreviating friends. I had a moment where I was, <laughs> I, I just woke up one day and thought, this was maybe 10 years ago, and I was like, mm-hmm. it says Timothy on my birth certificate and yeah. on my passport. It's what my parents wanted me to be called. Mm-hmm. Why aren't I Timothy? I'm, I'm going to yeah. change my Facebook name to mm-hmm. Timothy Sheel, and I'm going to tell everyone, hey, I want to be, be called Timothy from now on. What about Timo? No. <laughs> no, not Tim. I've never got Timo, actually. No. But Timothy didn't last. Like I reckon maybe oh. like I, I honestly it was probably about 15 was minutes say. later I was like, no, no. just No way. That's Do your parents call you that? No. No one calls me. Oh. Yeah, no one's ever called me that. So, um, yes. Well, Margaret. Nice. Thank you. Timothy. you got to take me to Hanoi too. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you should go. just come with me next time. Please. Yes. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks for the chat. Beautiful. Thank you. Keep crushing it. <laughs> Yay. Okay. I don't know what I'm going to do oh, with it Did yet. I talk too much? Bloody hell. 